Welcome back, Mech Warriors. This is Obob10025 with the history of a battle tech. Oh my god. These are the all time greats. Uh, Russ Bullock, Jordan Wiseman, Mitch Gittleman, and Randall. Basically, these guys actually started Battletech and, and did their well actually Jordan Wiseman actually started Battletech. But all these rest of the guys worked on it, did the stuff back in the old days, in the olden days back in 1984 with Battle Droids, and then went to Battletech. But these guys did it. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave the mic to uh, to these guys and these guys will tell you the history of what happened with Battletech Online or, or just Battletech in general so these are the greats of the industry ladies and gentlemen we've got the history of Battletech coming up not only is this a history of Battletech but this is history in the making we've got uh, Russ Bullock, Jordan Wiseman Mitch Gittleman and Randall Bills, thank you. I've been saying so many names tonight. Randall, of course. These guys have been involved in this franchise for a very long time. No disrespect, it's awesome. Uh, and literally, this is a dream come true for me, for a lot of you, I'm sure. These guys are, uh, you know, the creators, the, the people that keep the franchise going. I love all these guys, so please give it up for the history of Battletech. I couldn't hear that. Love you. All right, hopefully you guys can all hear me. We'll all try to talk nice and clearly into our mics. Uh, I think this is something that was really natural for this MechCon because every time I meet somebody anywhere, anywhere I go, and when they find out, you know, that I'm with Piranha, we make MechWare Online, is everyone has their own level of understanding of the history of Battletech and counting the whole, the, how the whole thing went down and, well, didn't this happen, then that, and... It's like, well, yeah, we kind of got it right. So I think I understand the story, but I'm going to try to get <laughs> the real players here. Everyone's going to uh, tell their own story. So obviously here at Piranha, we didn't get involved into the story of Mech Warrior until about 2008, 2009. Uh, so when we get to that point, I'll jump in a little bit. But uh, Jordan, obviously it starts with you. I mean, you had a little company called Fossa. That's the beginning, right? Uh, so why don't you start at the beginning and kind of take us through the 80s, maybe even through, the, <laughs> through uh, the 80s, maybe even through the mid-90s before someone else uh, jumps in. So we have to go back to uh, deal with, like, big shoulder pads and bad haircuts and yeah. the whole thing? I mean, is it the, all, of, all of the 80s? <laughs> uh, yeah, so where do we start? Uh, we had a company called FASA. I uh, started uh, that company in 1980 doing um, initially products for a role-playing game called Traveler that was uh, published by uh, Game Designers Workshop. And uh, then, I can't remember, what year is it? 83? I'm terrible with years. I'm the wrong guy to be doing history, by the way, because I can't remember crap. Um, but uh, I mean, you probably know. What year did, what year did we Battle Droids come out? 84. 84. All right, so Battle... Uh, so, um, I had seen, it basically started uh, by, by getting very inspired by looking at these giant walking mecha from uh, a bunch of enemies that had been popular and then had dived uh, in Japan and then wrote uh, Battletech and put out the original game named Battle Droids in 84. And then uh, Lucasfilm sent us a nasty gram about the word droids. Um, and we pointed out that Isaac Asimov had been using that phrase for about 30 years, but they had a lot of lawyers, and we didn't. So we changed the name to Battletech and uh, put out the, the first version of Battletech. It worked Battle out Tech. well. Yeah, I yeah, like actually Battletech better than Battle Droids anyway. Uh, and yeah, so we put out the first version in 84. Um, and I think I'm going to let these guys talk, and then we'll, I'll come back and correct things they said rather than me just going on forever. So, I just have a question <laughs> for the crowd. How many of you played Battle Droids? I mean, how many of oh you are old? <laughs> <laughs> Same damn thing. Uh, Randall, you go next, because your table's out. Uh, <clears throat> so I, uh, I actually shared this experience, similar to what Russ said. Oh, a little closer, sorry. Make sure everyone can hear me. Uh, similar to what Russ said, uh, I've been surprised at how many people I've talked with, so many of you tonight, and it's been fantastic. But so many of them are like, you know, how did you get into it? I got into it this way. How did you get into it? And it's, uh, it's great how we share those stories, and I realized that it was 
uh, 30 years ago this month that I picked up the second edition box set. That's awesome. So, like, I was into Voltron and Transformers and some other cartoons that had us super excited about that. And then I saw that second edition box set and being, I think it was 15 at the time, so 20 bucks, 15 year old. That took me a little while to convince myself to go buy it. And went down there with my friends, grabbed it, bought it, and I blame Jordan ever since because I haven't ever been able to stop. Uh, There's and, a theme here, actually. I blame Jordan for a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Of uh, but then, you know, fast forward 10 years, Wait, I had my been. My wife running. Dawn, she can get in on that too. But, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, but fast forward 10 years, and then I had been running some uh, local game conventions, so my name was starting to percolate a little bit at uh, FASA. And uh, then I have the geekiest total geek out moment, which is in 95, me and a whole bunch of my friends went up to Gen Con and then drove down to visit the FASA offices. And Brian Neistel, who was the Battletech line developer at the time, had a map of clan space up in his cubicle that had never been published yet. So we were distracting him so that we could scribble down the map of clan space so we could take it with me. And I still have that somewhere. I can't believe they offered me a job after I totally went nutso goob on them. No, you proved that you were a cheating clanner. But the... <laughs> Uh, but they did, in fact, uh, yeah. So, Randall, so you you started to work professionally then about 96? No, uh, with FASA Feb first? Fe February 96. I moved from Arizona in January <laughs> to Chicago. That was the culture shock of the century. To work uh, at FASA? Yeah, I was uh, the assistant line developer. The initial thought was that I would spend lots of time helping uh, Lou Prosperi with Earth Dawn and uh, Mike Mulvihill with Shadowrun and Brian Neistel with Battletech. And it was pretty much Battletech, 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 because it's okay, just such so a monster property. Just real briefly, the, the acquisition by Microsoft and Tops happened in like 99. Uh, yeah, end of 98, yeah. Okay, so yeah. let's stay ahead, or previous to that for now. Absolutely. We have where um, Randall kind of work, started working professionally in it. Now, what about you, Mitch? When did you start, and what officially? Uh, so my story about my interaction with Battletech, I, I'm not sure actually Jordan remembers this part, which is always the fun part where I get to tell him in front of a very large crowd and on uh, Twitch. So... What year was it that uh, we went, it, where you brought the Battletech pods? I think we brought the, uh, the pods to, to Gen Con in 88. 88, 87, I think. right? Yeah. 87. 80, it would have been 88. No, it wasn't Gen Con, though. This was in Chicago, the... Uh, uh, the Battletech Center? No, no, no. Oh, oh, at, the, oh, at E3. Uh, that uh, would have... The E3 yeah. didn't exist. We're that old. You're right, yeah. It was the Consumer Electronics Show. That's it. And it was, yeah, it would have been, it would have been 80, beginning of 88, 88, 88, 88, 87, yeah. 88. All right, so I went to the Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago in 1987 as a fan. I have no idea why I was there. And Jordan had the Battletech prototype pods, right? And they had no top, remember? They were kind of like wooden boxes. Yes, they were right? wooden boxes. <laughs> they were, what I meant That's was they exactly, were wooden boxes. Exactly what they were. And yeah. it was, and there was a long line, and you had a beautiful. I remember uh, there was a brochure, because you were trying to get investors, because you were you even then. <laughs> and so, uh, so Jordan was hawking these things, trying to get investors for the BattleTech things, and all I could see was joysticks. And if you remember, the original had two joysticks. No, yeah, the, uh, yeah, two joysticks um, for controlling weapons on either arm. Wait, and do actually, we know what we're talking about here? The Battletech centers? The big cockpits. Right? Yeah, Who played in the pods? Ah. That was, first of all, just for the history of not only Battletech but of gaming, this was made out of badass, <laughs> right? This is multiplayer gaming before multiplayer gaming. Oh, we had to invent network cards. Right? I mean, so it was like, what, 16? Am I right, 16? What, uh, what? Pods? 
Uh, yeah, there were eight, uh, two networks of eight each. Two, yeah. two networks works of eight pods. So you get into these things and you are in a battle mech, you close the door, there's microphones, you could, you know, you could cross chat with your uh, team. Just hundreds uh, of displays all over the place. Yeah, there were two MFDs, radar, you know. multifunctional di yeah, displays. Okay. Every button did something, which was a little over the top, but <laughs> anyway. So oh, actually, the version you you never saw the version we did before where the the uh, the joysticks had a solenoid in it, so that every time you pulled the trigger, depending upon which weapon you were firing, it would kick back more. So it actually had like a weapon kickback to it. It was we, it was we never really did that one. It, it was uh, a bad idea, but it was really fun. But then the other thing is, uh, just for the record, if you've ever played in the pods, this prototype had two joysticks in it, right? And and in order to torso twist, you had to turn both joysticks simultaneously. And I sat there in this thing as a fan thinking, I can improve the interface <laughs> of this game. Okay, so that's how you got to working with it or what? Oh, I've, oh you want to okay, cut to the jam yeah. chase. <laughs> anyway, that's when I vowed I was going to work on Battletech. That was, that was the moment right there. Flash forward several years, I was a, a paper and pencil game developer uh, competing with Jordan at, uh, poorly at Gen Con, I realized, don't compete against this guy. Join him, right? And we can rule the galaxy as father and son. So, uh, so what happened was uh, Jordan was working on a new thing for the Battletech pods that eventually became Crimson Skies. Everybody know Crimson Skies? Anybody want us to bring that back, by the way? I hope one day we can. Anyway, so what happened was Jordan said, hey, I've got this game that I want to make, and I came to work on Crimson Skies with Jordan, and uh, we shelved it for a while, and I, I actually I came like, on. Tell, tell these nice people what you said in your interview when I, when I hired you. What, what was the but, one thing you but said? It becomes a matter of public record. I know, but I, so, I, think, I think the Battletech right. fans deserve to know what you said. Please understand this is history, right? So I'm interviewing to work on Crimson Skies, to be the lead designer of Crimson Skies, and it's going really well. You know, we've got a real rapport going. It's like, yeah, this is going to be great. I mentioned that you had the very first, never mind. So I just realized that story is not. So anyway, what happened was uh, I said, uh, listen, I love this Crimson Skies thing. I want to work on this. Just please do not put me on Battletech. Yeah, so you know, what he, you know what I made him design for 20 years. And so, whoops. And yeah, please don't put me on Battletech is why. I said, because I fucking hate Battletech, Jordan. Now, were you at FOSA then up until the Oh, no, no, no. This is my job okay. interview. <laughs> oh. But you didn't get hired. At my interview, I told him I hated his game. OK, but you got hired. And then you were at FOSA up until? Three months later, and then I'm working on Battletech. OK. <laughs> that was before the reason. I hadn't learned the lore yet, and once I found out the background, I fell in love. You were hooked. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you ended up working there, though, right up until the acquisition time. Yeah. But I want. I want. Before we go to acquisition, I wore this shirt specifically. This was. This is from uh, the 1996 World Championships for the cockpits. So we started. We started doing World Championships in '94. Uh, so you're saying you did esports before we did it we as well? We did esports okay. back, at, back when, when you were in swaddling clothes, Ross. So, <laughs> yeah, we actually had, we had teams from Japan and then in the first year, and then in, by the 96, we had teams from four countries, five countries around the world. Um, uh, everybody came. It was, uh, it was broadcast on, on uh, cable TV. It was, uh, so I was just saying, you know, proto esports back in the day. So there you have it. Jordan invented that as well. Okay, so um, now let me see if I can get this part right. Because my childhood, my brother's out there somewhere. Hey, Chris. He's the one that brought home Battletech for me. And that was probably, oh, it wasn't Battle Droid, so I want to say 85, 86. Um, so sorry, I don't have quite as much street cred as some of you guys. And then, um, but me, I was always into the computer games. So when Chris was trying to get me to play the pen and paper, I'd play it. But as soon as I got my hands on the Crescent Hawks Inception, and I couldn't wait to play the Crescent Hawks Revenge, and of course, Mech Warrior 1 in 89. So, I guess there was Interpros or some of these various names thrown out, but bottom line is, 
I guess there's the Crescent Hawks games, there's the original MechWarrior, MechWarrior 2 and the expansion packs, even MechWarrior 3 up until then the acquisition happened right in that frame? Uh, no, not, not quite. So, um, yeah, it's Crescent Hawks, uh, Inception, Crescent Hawks Revenge, MechWarrior 1, MechWarrior 2, MechWarrior Mercs, um, and then uh, MechWarrior 3 is what we were working on. And that and was kind of like, if I remember correctly, that one ended up having Microprose and Microsoft on it. So had they, had they bought yet, or was that just sell, like publishing? Oh, we're getting into legal shit. All here, right, yeah. whatever. So that was about the time that we're talking so, 99. Well, there's so, still more, though, right? There's okay. the Super Nintendo game. Yeah. There's oh, the yeah. Kess My game. Right, yeah. Right? The, yeah the, the, uh, that was all FASA previous, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I there was a license from FASA, was, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, actually, you know, one of the very first MMOs was, was Battletech done by Kesmai, um, and it, it was, you know, fantastic game. Back in 92, uh, it was launched with using the front end for MechWarrior 2 and a back end written by Kesmai, uh, and it was really super, it was really cool. Don't forget uh, Mech Commander was in there. And Mech Commander? Yeah, Mech yeah. Commander was 97. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think 97. So. Yeah, 97. Yep. Mech Commander, then Mech Commander right. Gold, and we shipped Mech Commander 2 at Microsoft. Right. Okay. So I think the part that everyone's really interested in that gets people confused is around that acquisition, I guess, if you could explain how there was two parties, a Microsoft, I mean, okay, I mean, but these guys want to know this stuff. Right? They, because they keep asking me, and I keep trying to tell them, and they just... All right, so the, the, where that takes place is at the foundation of FASA Interactive, which was in 96, I think. I think 90... I, well, yeah, because, yeah. 90, 96, I think, is when we formed FASA Interactive. Um, or no, maybe it was earlier. It might have been 95. Anyway, um, when we said we, we... Because Activision had the license for 10 years. Uh, they shipped MechWarrior 2 right as their license expired, all right? And uh, we offered them a deal because we had this, developed this large tech team to do the cockpits, and we wanted to now extend that into, into PC play, especially since our team had been a lot of the help, uh, giving them a lot of help to do MechWarrior 2. And so we wanted to uh, you know, take over the development of that. So we talked to Activision and said, we want to we be the developer. Uh, you guys could be the publisher. Uh, and, but we want you to invest into, into the development company. And they said, no, we're, we're not interested in that because it was before MechWarrior 2 came out. So uh, Microprose, which was uh, actually, no, it was before the merger of Microprose. It was, um, uh, what was the name? Anyway, another, another software company. Yeah, Gilman okay. with, um, I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, um, so another, another software company invested into that and they invested money. FASA invested the electronic entertainment rights for its properties into Fast Interactive, and that's how the company was formed. Okay. Hey, you guys wanted to know this stuff. And okay. this is when it gets complicated. Yeah, it's a, uh, anyway, so, that, so that's how the, the electronic rights were then separated from the rest of the rights. So FASA had everything else except for Fast Interactive, which had the electronic entertainment rights. Then MechWarrior 2 comes out, triples the size of Activision uh, pretty much instantly. I think actually I read only last year that they still said that MechWarrior, they ship more units of MechWarrior 2 than any game in Activision history up because to that now. Because they shipped it with like every video oh, card it came that with was like, ever created, right? And, yeah. and like OEM. cereal boxes. I mean, it was everywhere. It was crazy. Anyway, um, they, uh, and so then Bobby did what Bobby does, which is, you know, come, come after you. Um, so we agreed on, on him doing MechWarrior 2 Mercenaries while we developed MechWarrior 3. Um, anyway, so that's where the rights got split was at that point. Then, then Microsoft buys Fast Interactive, uh, and that's how they get the computer game rights. And then later, I formed a company called WizKids, uh, where I did Mage Knight and HeroClix, and, and then eventually um, MechWarrior Dark Age. And that company buys FASA, and then Topps buys that company, and then Toronto mm -hmm. buys Topps. It's, it's like that cartoon you see, like one fish swallowing another fish, swallowing another yeah. fish. Swall yeah, it's There's like always that. a bigger fish. There's always bigger fish. Okay, yes. so I'm going to bring Randall back in real for quick. So when did Catalyst become the uh, gatekeepers for, for Tops? So, you know, I, I wonder if the history of all this has to be as complex as it does because it fits well with Battletech, which is such a ridiculously complex game, which of course I love to death, but it is very complex. 
So after FASA closed its doors, I, of course, wondering, what the heck am I going to do? I had my dream job. Where is that going to go? And then Jordan immediately went, well, we're going to keep doing some awesome stuff over here. You know, do you want to keep being involved in that? I'm like, uh, of course. Uh, but then they also immediately turned around and re-licensed the rights for the board game in the original format to a company called FamPro. And Fantasy Productions was the German publisher of Battletech for years and years and years. And so they simply formed a U.S. publishing arm consisting of myself and Rob Boyle to be the developer for Shadowrun. And we were the f that was it for FanPro. So then I was working full-time for Jordan at WizKids and full-time for FanPro. You said, you said full-time twice. I know. <laughs> I still have no idea how I did that. Uh, so that went on for about five years or so. And then somewhere in there, uh, myself and Lauren Coleman, uh, who has published, you know, 15 plus Battletech novels and quite a few of the other, uh, Blaine Pardo and a lot of the other novelists were like, hey, we want to keep writing fiction in this universe. And so we went to Jordan and acquired the rights to do Battlecore which is a fiction subscription online endeavor. And that was under a company called In Media Res Productions. And then... You know, I don't think I even knew what I was getting into when I asked. Uh, I know. I thought I knew a lot of this stuff, but there's a lot in here. You guys so nobody you like this stuff? Knows. Are you interested? I think you are. So yeah. then FanPro Would was... You like it? We could tell dirty stories about mechs if you want instead. Okay, so, so then we, uh, we got about... I think you're the next. I think Catalyst is the next stage. Sure, so I, can, I can totally suck away time from that. That's good. <laughs> okay, all right. Carry well, on. But, Carry so, on. but here's the funny thing, though, because so FanPro was having some issues because it was us, the U.S. division, having to deal with what I like to call the German overlords uh, over in Germany. And so there was some friction that was really causing problems uh, in how the two companies were operating. And so finally, I kept telling WizKids, you know, look, we, you need to help us fix this issue. There's, it's causing us real problems of being able to get games out the door. And it all came to a head. And finally, I kind of had to force the issue. And uh, there was a, a Joe Hauk who had been sent over from Tops to kind of help clean stuff up, so to speak, happened to be sitting there as we're all describing having this same exact discussion because of course he had no idea about the history and he's like so do you guys want the license and we're like um sure which was fantastic but it meant we went from being and say an eighty thousand dollar a year company to a 1.2 million dollar company like at the drop of a hat which sounds really awesome but it almost destroyed us um, but that's suddenly just out of nowhere. So we kind of put ourselves year, at the right place that, to do it. Roughly? Uh, that was 2007 is when that transition happened, right? Right. Catalyst was formed about April 2007. And that takes us right up to date, really. Yep. I mean, from there till now. Yep. Okay. Okay, let's go back to video game land. Um, okay, we're, we're, at Mike, we're at MechWarrior 3. That one happened... Uh, at Microsoft. By the no, time no MechWarrior 3 came out around 1997, around the same time that we shipped Mech Commander 2. I want to say 99. Mech Commander 1, right? Yeah, that's right? What? I want to well, say 99. Because then we started but... MechWarrior 4 at Microsoft. Right? Yeah. Mech so Warrior... MechWarrior 4 was developed at Microsoft, and Mech Commander 2 was developed at Microsoft. Okay. Now, you were at Microsoft during MechWarrior, the whole MechWarrior 4 games, right? Yeah, but I actually was not very connected uh, to it. That was really more in Mitch's camp because I was creative director for the, for the whole platform for all of Microsoft Entertainment, um, which started out rationally with us just doing PC games, but then we got into this craziness called Xbox, and all of a sudden I was just flying all over the world working with, with different developers all over the world on all, all of the portfolio of titles from Halo you know, to Bloodwake and a thousand titles in between. So I actually, only, my only, I would only come in and talk to Mitch and, and uh, TJ and Heinz, you know, like every couple months about the game. That was really more in their camp. So maybe Mitch, what uh, MechWarrior brand products did you work on at Microsoft? 
at Microsoft, I shipped Mech Commander Gold. I shipped Mech Commander 2. I helped out with Mech Warrior 4. I shipped the very first Xbox Live game, Mech Assault. And then uh, I was the executive producer of Mech Assault 2. I'm still trying to forgive you for that. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot to forgive in this whole career. We're just touching, it's like the tip of the iceberg. And don't Google that. And so that would have taken us up to about like, I want to say 2004 or so with Mech Assault 2, or it was Xbox uh, One still. So Mech Assault was 2003, I think. That's when Xbox Live launched. Okay. And then also there was Mech Warrior 4 Dark Knight. Or Black Knight, I'm sorry, I mean. Yeah, <laughs> Black Knight. Dark Knight. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, expansion that, That's when I put all the Batman logos yeah. on all the mechs. It was awesome. So we're, get, we're getting to the point where... Because I, I first contacted you in uh, 2008. I believe it was 2008. Because you had formed a company called Smith & Tinker about 2008 or 2007? Uh, yeah, 2000, somewhere in there. Yeah, but so, no, it must have been 2006, actually. 2006. So I guess, briefly, how did you manage to get the license uh, back at Smith & Tinker? Well, actually, I, I didn't get it at Smith & Tinker. They're and still trying to figure that out, I think. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, so I had uh, I'd left Microsoft. I had gone off uh, to do WizKids, and then after WizKids, I did a company called 42 Entertainment where we did things like um, the ARGs for Halo 2, I Love Bees, and all the Dark Knight ARGs and all that kind of stuff. And during that period, I, I had been constantly trying to get something going on the FASA properties because they were just laying dormant at Microsoft. Um, and at one point, thought I had succeeded in, in negotiating a, uh, the ability to, uh, to purchase them. But then at the last minute, that kind of got turned from a purchase back into a license. Uh, so I licensed those and then start, set about trying to start working on, on how to redevelop the properties. Uh, then actually uh, simultaneously, Gilman Louie, who was, uh, was the investor in Fast Interactive all those years ago, uh, called me and said, hey, I'm starting this new toy company. Um, uh, he's a VC, and he needed someone to run the creative for it. And we met, and I, I agreed to do that. That became Smith & Tinker. And so the rights that I negotiated and that license kind of got rolled into Smith & Tinker just to be non-competitive so that I didn't, weren't, wasn't competing with this very large VC-funded company. They, they weren't concerned I was distracted with that stuff. So that's how those rights ended up inside of Smith & Tinker. All right. And I guess it worked, out, um, it worked out well for Piranha because now I had been running Piranha Games since 2000. So this is eight years in, and this is one of those brands that I kind of looked into like probably once a year, thinking like, well, oh, geez, wouldn't it be great? And of course, I could never really find any reason to believe, I guess. And then all of a sudden, I think it was a Google search that came across with maybe some like small press release that had hit in 2008 when Smith and Tinker's forum and something about the rights. And I thought, whoa, you know, this could be, <laughs> this could be something I could look into. So, I mean, I remember contacting you, and you know, we'd never met before. I don't know if, I don't think you'd even heard of our company. And uh, I said, look, I want to make a Mecha Warrior game. And, you know, Jordan was really receptive in the sense that he was like, well, look, if you're for real, and basically to real means, uh, real to me means that you're going to actually do something. So you're going you're gonna to spend money, you're going to make something, you're going to make a demo. Like, you know, not just like, hey, just sit on the rights or whatever, right? So that's how, do you guys remember the video we put out in 2009? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was so awesome. That was, <laughs> I mean, we, we really thought that was going to become, you know, our, our product. I mean, we thought it looked really great. It, it got everyone excited. I traveled around with Jordan. I, I'm not sure if you were there all the time, but yeah, it, yeah. we went to all the publishers. And everywhere we went, I felt like, oh, for sure, those guys are going to, I think they're going to do this. But, of course, the challenge we had was, uh, we could only go PC and on the Xbox, Xbox 360. And in this era, we're talking 2008, that was a kind of a crash in the industry moment. And it was like, unless we thought we could sell, just, I'm talking as a publisher, like, it, unless they thought they could do three to five million units, they just weren't interested. Of course, I thought it was ridiculous because I looked at all the products they were publishing and I thought, wouldn't you rather have a guaranteed, you know, this than those? But it just didn't happen. You know, it just ran out of momentum, ran, ran out of steam, and uh, we were surprised, but it just didn't work out. 
Um, and then we were lucky enough to be able to license the rights from Spit and Tinker after you had, you had moved on, I believe. And uh, that's when we decided, you know, the way we had to do it uh, was to make this free-to-play game because uh, free-to-play and was starting to show itself as, as being possible for creating something, I guess I'll use the word, like, legit, like, not just uh, cheesy little caricature games, but actual games, that something we'd be proud of. And so it was really our way of saying, well, this is, this is how we're going to be able to do it. So uh, we thought, let's go for it. It's either going to be the last game we ever make or it's going to work out. Um, and I uh, know I can't believe we're here today. This is a little over five years from the time we first started developing MechWarrior Online. So that pretty much takes us up to date. So I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. It just felt like an appropriate moment for a five-year ride to get to this point with MechWarrior Online. And I want to thank these guys for being here, although I'm going to probably repeat myself when I come up on stage at 9. So I'll stop there so I don't repeat myself too much. Well, and can, we, can I say thank to you and Piranha for hosting this fantastic event? It's been amazing. Now, this is a very, very, very big deal because here we are. We've got MechWarrior Online. We, you know, we got Piranha Games. We got Hairbrain Schemes. We got Catalyst. It's, it's not about one game anymore. It's about the Battletech universe, and it's about you guys and serving you and serving the universe. Our this games don't badass. exist without you guys all across the board. None of these games exist without you guys. Thanks. Okay, so Randall, I think we're going to leave you on the stage. This is your big moment. Okay, you ready? Okay, uh, I guess. And yeah. then um, I got some you guys. Stuff. I can talk. Yeah, we'll you up. guys are like 8.30, and then I'll be back at 9 to talk to you guys, okay? Target acquired.